one size fits all. Located at 2107 North Decatur Boulevard. Eight. Don't miss the Voyager van sale. KTNV 13. 200 South Rainbow near Albertsons and at the corner of Paradise and Flamingo. Live from the seven seas, it's Captain Adams VHS Pirate Ship. And now, here's Captain Adam and Little Creed. Yes, welcome to Captain Adam's VHS Pirate Ship. Hello, everyone. Hi, Little Reed. We decided to do something a little different today, and we're doing a Tonight Show-style opening. Oh, so that's, that's why, why we have a live studio audience. audience. Yes, that's why we have a live audience. Well, that's great. And what a terrific crowd they are. Yes, yes, they certainly are. Well... Since we have an audience, now's a great time to tell you what's going on in my life. I'm taking a first aid course down at the community college, but you know, it has a lot of hard questions. Oh? Sure does. Like, how do you stop external bleeding? Oh, I know that one. You do? Sure. You go inside. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Um, uh, anyways, say, did you hear about that billionaire whose accountant made a mistake and ended up giving away millions of dollars to charity? Hmm, huh. Really? Was he a philanthropist? Well, he wasn't happy. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my. You know, um, I take back what I said about this audience. They're not, uh, they're not terrific at all. They're, uh... Pretty hostile. To say the least, let's go with a different intro. What do you say? Let's go with the off-color opening. Sure. Uh, let's get out of here. Hey, little creep. How the f*** are ya? Oh, well, you know, I'm doing pretty f***ing good. Well, that's really f***ing great. Yeah, it is. So what, what the f*** are you up to? Hey, I just had a job interview. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I did. And the lady tells me she's got three openings that need filled. And I says to her, I says, I know you do. Oh, 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 oh. Gosh, this just isn't working out too well. Oh, no, it's, no, it's not, is it? What do you say we lose the studio audience and go with the original intro? Yeah, that sounds pretty f***ing good. Ahoy there, mates. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Gosh, little creep, what's wrong with you? <sighs> well, I have a term paper due for my modern history class at the community college. And of course, it's very important. And I don't know what to write it on. Why not just paper? Gasp! Is everything a joke to you? I meant the topic. This paper is very I'm, I'm sorry. important. I'm I meant sorry. the topic. I'm, I'm the sorry. topic! Um, so, what's the premise? Well, now that we're being serious again, it's supposed to be about innovations of the late 20th century. Well, why not go with VHS? VHS, you say? Well, does it really have that extensive of a history? Mm, sure it does. Really? Yeah, plenty of eras throughout the lifespan of VHS, each one of them very important. What do you mean? Mm, well, uh, I know. Let's ask V.C. Arnold. Oh, could we? Sure thing. Hey, V.C. Arnold! Hey, Activated! And standing by! What can you tell us about the eras of VHS? Processing! Processing. Error, error, error. Un un unable to comply. No such data exists. No such data, no such data. There are no chronicle documents regarding information about your VHS. My database does not encompass information that does not exist. This idiot! Get, get out of here with your VHS. What? Really? Yes, really. Why would they lie about that? Now stop asking me you stupid questions or I'll kill you! Oh my, well, so much for that. Mm, don't worry, little creep. I'll help you out. You will? Sure I will. Well, mates, it looks like we're on our own. So sit back and enjoy today's adventure. The Eras of an Empire. A history of the VHS timeline. 
Yo ho ho! Time for the show! Yar! Yar! VHS, or Video Home System, a home media empire that was a world on to itself. A world that became so big, it absorbed our own. Though it has long since been deemed obsolete and replaced with quote-unquote better technology in the form of DVDs and Blu-rays, there's no denying that VHS for a time was the dominant home media format. In its lifespan, VHS did have its fair share of competitors with Betamax, Laserdisc, and CEDs, but none of them would stand the test of time, and VHS would again and again prove to be more durable and efficient than any other home media format. In the beginning, the home video market was wild and wooly, uncharted and untamed, and soon the consumers would decide who would be the king, and shortly after, VHS took its rightful place on the throne. VHS then grew and grew and became an empire, and for a time, VHS just wasn't merely part of the home media landscape, it was the home media landscape. It would become a huge part of our history, not just as a society, but also as a species. It changed us in a way, it brought new aspects to our lives, like suddenly we were able to record our favorite show, and now we were putting stuff like blank videotapes on our shopping list. It boosted the economy by giving way to a whole new job market and career field, such as video rental stores and VCR repair shops. It became part of our everyday lives and gave us new words in our lexicons like video and tape and cassettes. Well, I guess tape existed before that, but you know what I mean. And by the way, video comes from the Latin word vedere or vedere, which means to see or by means to see. VHS was indeed a bigger deal than perhaps it'll ever get true credit for. As important as it was to us, it's sad that it was so quickly abandoned the next shiny object. But that's how technology goes, and there's no sense in being bitter about it. As human beings, we should always try to advance ourselves in the forms of different innovations. And those innovations would cascade through everything, including home media. And it was only a matter of time before VHS would be bumped from the throne. And as we know now, that is precisely what happened. But despite its end by obsolescence, VHS would have a lengthy and magnificent lifespan. It all began in 1976 with the release of the first ever commercial VCR or video cassette recorder. It was invented and produced by the Japan Victor Company, or JVC as you may know them. Soon after, VHS would become a juggernaut, and it would remain that way until 2006 when it was deemed obsolete and commercial VHS was discontinued as a format. Famously, the last VHS ever commercially produced was for the film A History of Violence. That particular tape became an instant relic, and if you're trying to find this, uh, Good luck, and if you do find it, good luck for finding it under $100. So from 1976 all the way up till 2006, VHS was a home media titan. For 30 prolific years, VHS reigned supreme, and within those 30 years, there are separate eras. Eras that separate and define the technology that was used for this home media king. Yes, there was always advancements, innovations, and evolutions within this technology. These changes would be represented within the models of cassettes they used to the very magnetic tape itself. Now, of course, amongst these changes, the most notable would be the cases or packaging the cassettes would come in. And that would become an aspect of VHS that would take on the delicate balance between form and function. With any kind of product and or marketing, you want the packaging to be efficient and aesthetically pleasing. And that mix of efficient and appealing can be a tricky tango. And through the evolution of VHS, we certainly can see what worked and what simply didn't. Through the VHS lifespan, the VHS packaging has gone through many changes, ranging from the beautiful yet pointless, uh, like the Kardashians, to the durable and cumbersome, um, somehow also like the Kardashians, to the neat yet awfully fragile, to the unnecessary and downright wasteful. 
also like the Kardashians. From the streamlined and efficient to the, um, I'm not really sure what's going on here. And to ones that were nice to look at, but not efficient in the slightest. These packaging designs define the VHS eras of which I speak. And these said eras have not been discussed or talked about, most certainly not labeled as the separate eras in which they should be, at least until now. Lucky for you, I had devised a chronicalized scale and timeline of the VHS eras. And today, I'm going to be explaining exactly Exactly what I mean. So sit back, relax, and have yourself a heap and hunk of history because it's today's adventure The Eras of an Empire, a history of the VHS timeline. VHS has a tremendous history, all packed into 30 years, and if you compare that to the world's history in general, well, 30 years certainly is nothing. But for VHS, those 30 years were huge. The advancements came quickly and frequently, and the technology of VHS evolved at an astounding rate. So within those 30 years of the VHS lifespan, a lot happened. It all began in 1976, officially. But before all that, the seeds of commercial VHS were planted in the fertile soil of history. 1968 would see the birth of magnetic tape, which of course would go on to be the technology behind VHS. And I have previously talked about this in a video showcasing the film Predator 2, and in that video I somehow ended up talking about the early years of VHS. Yeah, I'm not really sure how I ended up talking about that in that video, but you'd have to watch it for yourself. It does make sense. The link will be in the comments. But for now, let's take a look at that footage. Roll the tape! So yes, the company that would become, and as we know them today, as 20th Century Fox Home Video, oh, I'm sorry, 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment, started off life as Magnetic Video, founded in 1968. Now, I know what you're thinking, 1968, how is that possible? Home Video was not a thing until 1976. Well, that's a great question, and you're correct to ask that. Let's keep in mind, however, that Home Video didn't exist until 1976, and that is when VHS in Betamax was born, giving the world a format to watch videos at home. But video did exist before that, but only in a commercial format, meaning that video was only available to television stations, and what we know as VHS and beta was not a thing. Yeah, the very early form of videotape is basically unrecognizable to what we came to know. The first versions of commercial video was basically a film reel, only it wasn't film, it was magnetic tape. Now, to avoid giving everyone, including myself, an aneurysm, I'm going to avoid all the sciency stuff. This reel form format would become known as the quad, or just quad film, or quad tape, or something quad. It's quad. In 1969, video would become a little bit more recognizable with the U-Matic, the first video cassette. Now again, they were only for commercial use and weren't available to the public, but this is the forefather of the VHS tape, or Betamax cassette, whatever your flavor was. Not too long after its conception, the U-Matic cassette would evolve into what we know as home video, and in 1976, the VHS empire began. Pretty neato, huh? Anyways, the lifespan of VHS was jam-packed with activity, and a lot happened in such a relatively short amount of time. And there most certainly were certain junctures in the lifespan of VHS that really defined the evolution of the technology. Within those action-packed 30 years, there are certain eras that deserve to be chronicled and have definitions onto themselves. And so far, and at least to my knowledge, no such scale or definition exists. So I decided to devise my own referencing scale and separate these certain eras. It's a little something I like to call the car scale, or the Captain Adam reference scale. It's a timeline that pinpoints and separates these certain eras that define the evolution of VHS. The car scale separates these eras based on the packaging designs because that is the most notable trait. And with that also goes the evolution of VHS manufacturing and distribution. So to begin things, the pre-VHS era that was highlighted in that video clip will be referred to as the grandfather 
era. And that was from 1968 to 1976. Now, it doesn't really have much to do with VHS, considering that VHS wasn't really a thing yet, but it did plant the seeds and raise the foundation for the home media giant. It's sort of like the Neolithic era of VHS. So from 68 to 76, according to the car scale, is referred to as the grandfather era or the pre-VHS era. 1976 would see the official birth of the video home system, or as it would always be known from there on out, VHS. 76 marks the year when the technology of magnetic tape was finally harnessed for home use, and that being the case, 76 also saw the birth of Betamax, and soon after, the format wars would begin. But in these dawning years of home media technology, no one really knew what was going on. It was all new turf, so the format wars hasn't really begun yet or is even a thing. Everyone was just too busy trying to figure out whether or not this new technology was going to be successful. Far too busy to consider the raging battle that would lie ahead. This was a blossoming time for VHS and Betamax, and it would take about four years for this technology to really gain traction in a consumer market. And hence, according to the car scale, 1976 to 1980 is referred to as the origin era. This is when our little foals were learning to walk. Awkward at first, but eventually they succeeded very well. During the origin era, the technology of course was still very new, and that being the case, there really weren't that many VHS distributors yet. Among these very few distributors was Magnetic Home Video and Media Home Entertainment. Yes, the Media Home Entertainment, the VHS distributor that would eventually gain its own cult following amongst VHS collectors based on the titles it released, which were mainly horror movies or B-movies. It's pretty interesting to know that Media Home Entertainment was one of the first VHS distributors, especially considering how big it would eventually become. Well, Media Home Entertainment would be big, at least amongst VHS collectors and horror fans. The origin era would see VHS packaging have a very simple beginning. Yes, it all began with the cardboard sleeve, a packaging design that VHS would eventually be synonymous with. Though the premise is the same, the design is a bit different. These early sleeves did not have an opening at the bottom in which you could simply slide the tape out. Instead, it had a flap that folded and closed, resembling more of a box than a sleeve. The cassettes that were used for these early VHS weren't that different than what we came to know. They are, however, noticeably heavier than a more recent VHS. Yeah, seriously, you could kill a man with one of these things. It's almost like Tonka made them. That is because the early cassette shells were way thicker than more modern VHS, and so was the magnetic tape that was used. Durability was the name of the game. They wanted to give the impression that VHS would last forever. During the origin era, VHS tapes certainly should have been considered durable goods. The 70s begat the 80s, and during this time, VHS and Betamax were doing very well and had proven that this technology was going to be around for a while. And since VHS and Betamax were doing very well, it afforded distributors more room to play with, meaning that the packaging designs for VHS was getting ready to become very interesting in 1980 would see the beginning of what the car scale refers to as the Romantic Era. The Romantic Era is certainly the most interesting era of VHS, given all the different packaging designs that came from it. According to the car scale, the Romantic Era spans from 1980 to 1987, and this is surely the Renaissance period of VHS. And within those seven years of the Romantic Era, we, as the consumer, would receive many examples of packaging designs that would go on to represent the nostalgia behind VHS. Because with basically all of these packaging designs, you take one look at them and you automatically know, hey, they're early releases. Though some of these designs are definitely nostalgic and fun to look at, some of them weren't all that efficient. Hell, some of them are just downright wasteful. A good example of this is the famous Big Box. The most famous distributor to use this design would be USA Home Video. The Big Box design is very nice to look at. It is rather aesthetically pleasing, though it certainly stands out amongst all your other VHS, which was sort of the point. At this point in time, VHS was doing rather well, which also meant that the market was becoming rather flooded, which meant that if you were a distributor, you wanted your product to stand alone. You wanted to be recognized amongst all the others. You wanted to stand out, which led to some pretty extravagant packaging designs. The big box is certainly among them. And though they did indeed stand out amongst the other VHS, the trade-off here is, well, 
it's not very efficient or very user friendly. There was just one too many steps involved. The big box design consisted of a big cardboard box in which it gets its name and within that big cardboard box was housed a plastic clamshell which held the actual cassette. Which begs the question, why didn't they just use the plastic clamshell? There's an awful lot of work involved just to get to the tape. And to add insult to injury, it's not like the big boxes were made out of sturdy material. The cardboard was very flimsy. We're talking bottom shelf corrugated wood pulp that barely passes for cardboard. Which meant that every time you opened these damn things, you basically tore it. Which is why, if you're looking for one of these for your VHS collection, it's almost impossible to find one in at least good condition. Watching a VHS tape really should just be a one-step process. You shouldn't have to open a case only to open another case. The big box design would eventually evolve into losing the internal plastic clamshell and just have the tape floating around in this big cardboard box. Well, there would be these little cardboard buffers that would keep the tape from just flopping around, but it's all wasted material. It's totally unnecessary. The whole thing is akin to the long boxes of early CD releases. It's unnecessary material, and unnecessary material means higher production costs. At this point in the lifespan of VHS, and Betamax for that matter, it was all trial and error. No one really knew what they were doing, especially when it came to packaging designs. The big box design is a perfect example of this. But another perfect example is the book box, a design made famous by MGM Home Video. This design gets its namesake from the fact that it resembles a book. I'm sure we all could have figured that out. And this design is very clever and very aesthetically pleasing. I certainly dig them. They're among my favorite VHS packaging. But again, from a production standpoint, it's just highly unnecessary. There's way too much material used, which drives up the cost and in turn drives up the cost for the consumer. And there's absolutely no good in having a product that your customers cannot afford. From a durability standpoint, well, it just was not there. These were rather flimsy, not unlike the big box designs. And like the big box designs, a cheaper cardboard was used, but the production cost was still rather high. I simply love the book box design, but it's totally inefficient and wasteful. And though MGM is pretty much synonymous with this design, they weren't the only distributors to use this. The first Warner Home Video releases also utilized the book box design. The big box and book box weren't the only beautiful yet wasteful VHS packaging designs. Counted favorably among them is also the famous slide box, which is exactly what it sounds like it is. It was a cardboard housing in which the VHS cassette was placed in, and that slid out of a main cardboard sleeve. And to my knowledge, it doesn't seem like there were too many distributors to use this packaging method. In fact, it seems like it was only 20th Century Fox home video. The slide box design was rather unique, but again, it was very wasteful. And speaking of that, let's go back to the big box real quick. Some distributors that utilized the early big box designs wouldn't use an internal plastic clamshell. Instead, they would use a plastic tray or styrofoam. So apparently the thing to do back then, if you were a VHS distributor, was take all of your money out of your pocket and set it on fire. Wasteful packaging most certainly was a thing back then. And by the way, the Warner Home Video book boxes, even though they were slightly bigger than the MGM book boxes, were no sturdier. I mean, just look what happens to them. Come on, these cases are supposed to protect the tape. And speaking of wasteful, some distributors would even do this weird thing. I mean, what, uh... What is this? I don't even know what to call this. Well, one thing you can certainly call it is unnecessary. Why would they do this? It's almost like there's a surplus of awful cardboard back then and they had to use it. It seems like they were flaunting the fact that they could waste materials. Well, the Romantic Era wasn't entirely made up of cardboard packaging consisting of the beautiful yet useless and the completely unnecessary. Plastic would come into play as well. Not just crappy plastic. We're talking good grade plastic, hard stuff sturdy, durable, good old plastic. And the Romantic Era would see the birth of what would become the second most common VHS packaging, the clamshell. And sure, this packaging design more than likely cost a lot to manufacture as well, but it wasn't wasteful and it was highly utilitarian because these would actually protect the tape. And there really wasn't any wasted material. Everything you see is exactly what you need. These were a good idea. And even though 
And if you're a fan of the show, then you know that I absolutely cannot stand what would become known as kids' clamshells. They were still a good idea because they would protect the tape very well. Their mission was to protect the tape at, at all costs. costs. It didn't take Water Home Video very long to figure out that the big box design just wasn't working out very well. So they employed the plastic clamshell design and the early Warner Home Video library was born. And this packaging design is basically what Warner Home Video is most famous for. And this design worked so well that it got the attention of Walt Disney Home Video, and they decided to use their own little version as well. And if you have any of the early Walt Disney Home Video releases, then you know that that plastic is way thicker than what they ended up using. I mean, this early VHS release of Baby's Secret of the Lost Legend is basically a flak jacket. Yeah, the early Walt Disney Home Video release pieces are certainly different than the later ones because they would eventually streamline the design and use a lower grade plastic and that would become the template for any kind of cartoon or kids movie or any kind of film that could be considered family oriented at all. The romantic era certainly was active in innovations of VHS especially when it comes to packaging but there were your typical cardboard sleeves in existence as well. Yeah the seven year renaissance of the romantic era wasn't all extravagant packaging and wasteful materials. The cardboard sleeve was still very much a thing and some distributors would stick to that design. Yes, while some went bold with their VHS packaging, there were others that were busy streamlining a simple idea. And Paramount Home Video would take that simple idea and put their own little spin on it with this basically forgotten about sleeve design that resembles more of a box. Now, this design, however, didn't last very long as they didn't use it very much. Eventually, they would just go with a typical cardboard sleeve, as did many distributors towards the end of the Romantic Era. Many of these distributors would figure figure out that you did not need extravagant packaging, a simple sleeve would do just fine. Yeah, the old adage of your first instinct is usually the correct one certainly works here because the first VHS packaging designs were basically a simple sleeve, and streamlined versions of this simple design would become the most common packaging template. They just got rid of all the extra flaps, and voila, you have your common VHS sleeve. So the basic premise of the first VHS packaging design that came from the origin era would end up closing out the Romantic Era. Really, the cardboard sleeve and the plastic clamshell were the only packaging designs to survive the Romantic Era. Yes, even though those fantastic seven years gave us some beautiful and interesting things, efficiency will always come out on top. As 1987 came into full bloom, VHS would almost be as evolved as it ever would be. The cost of manufacturing VHS at this time had become slightly cheaper than it had been. VHS was no longer a budding technology and was very much a household name. Pretty much everyone had a VCR and VHS was everywhere. It had been declared the winner of the format wars and 87 would usher in what the car scale refers to as the early modern era, which lasted from 1987 to 1991. Now, as far as eras go, that's not a very long time, but within those few years, the advancements of VHS were basically approaching their zenith. The technology behind VHS had found its footing and it had evolved so much that there really wasn't much more you could do with it, meaning that the technology was sort of perfected, which allowed manufacturers to focus on getting cheaper and more advanced materials for VHS production, which translated into cheaper prices for the consumer, and the MSRP would go from $100 or $70 to $40 or $30, sometimes even cheaper, depending on what it was. The big deal here is, up to this point in time, VHS had been so expensive that not everyone could afford to buy them. That is why video rental stores had been so important to VHS, because because even though the product was far too expensive for the average consumer to buy, there was still a profit to be made with the rental market. Up to this point in time, VHS had primarily relied on rental profits because, hey, if you can't afford to buy it, you can certainly afford to rent it. Which is basically how VHS got off the ground, but the early modern era would see a paradigm shift in this pattern. Cheaper materials would lead to cheaper manufacturing, which would lead to cheaper retail prices, which in turn meant that more people were buying VHS as opposed to strictly renting renting them, and VHS sales would shift from the video rental market to consumer households. And VHS promotion and marketing would become more lax as well, and you would start to see VHS commercials on television. And these commercials would tell you the retail price, instead of simply telling you that this movie was on VHS now, so go rent it. VHS was 
becoming more obtainable than ever. And though not much had happened in these humble few years, the early modern era would see the prices of VHS continue to drop. The end of the early modern era would come quickly, and 1991 would usher in what the car scale refers to as the economic era or the modern era. And this era would basically be the entirety of the 90s, lasting from 1991 to 1999. Within this eight-year stretch, VHS would become as cheap as it ever would be, which is why it's also called the economic era. Brand new VHS of new releases were available for purchase for under $20. And more people were buying VHS, but that does not mean the video rental market was fading away. In fact, it was flourishing, doing better than it had ever done before. I mean, just because you could buy VHS cheaply now doesn't mean people did all the time. Most times, people would just want to rent a movie. They didn't buy every single one that came out, but sometimes there were those movies you just had to own. And since the prices of brand new VHS were as cheap as they ever had been, this concept was totally accessible. And speaking of accessible, at this time, you could pretty much buy new VHS everywhere. Drug stores, grocery stores, retail stores. It didn't matter. VHS was all over the place. VHS had really come into its own, and there wasn't any stopping it, at least not anytime soon. This was the age of VHS, and it was in full throttle at this time. And this era all started with one of the biggest VHS events in history, and that is the Universal Monster Monsters Collection, released in 1991 by MCA Universal Home Video. If you were around at this time, then you know how big of a deal this was. The promotion for this was everywhere. This whole thing was huge, and it pushed VHS marketing into the stratosphere. It had a promotional partnership with Pepsi and Frito-Lay. You could not go anywhere that sold these products without seeing promos for these tapes. And since everyone sold these products, you saw this all the time. This was a very important VHS collection because it brought these classic monsters movies to a new generation and it ended up being a huge VHS collection too as it continued to grow into 1994 and speaking of VHS collections the modern era or economic era would also be unofficially known as the box set era because within this era the VHS box set had become a thing and was doing very well they were everywhere if a film franchise had more than two movies you can bet there was going to be a VHS box set for it so the modern era or economic era rolled Hold on, and VHS would be as advanced as it ever would become, and also as cheap. And towards the end of this era, we see why it's also called the economic era. In 1996, the cost of VHS manufacturing and production would be at an all-time low. This would give major distributors, which also happen to be major film studios, a great idea. They would take advantage of these cheaper manufacturing costs and re-release a lot of their older titles on this newer and cheaper VHS. And they would arrange them into collections, like the Warner Brothers Hits Collection, the 20th Century Fox Selections Collection, and the MG. GM Movie Time Collection. This was a very clever marketing gimmick and made the whole thing look great. And of course, that cheap MSRP didn't hurt much either. Yeah, they were priced at $5 or $10, which is why they would eventually become known as the Five and Dime VHS. Though these cheaper prices were now possible, the cost of a newer movie on VHS was still around 1995. As the modern era or economic era was coming to a close, the Five and Dime VHS was flourishing at full strength. But in the background, in the distance, far away on the horizon, a storm was brewing. In 1997, a new home media technology was on the rise. And for the first time in a long while, the power of VHS was challenged and its longevity questioned. That technology was the digital video disc, or as it would become known, the DVD. It was like a CD, but there was a movie on it. Not just a movie, but other stuff too special features, deleted scenes, commentary, stuff we had never seen before. It was a totally interactive home media experience, which was something you just could not get from a VHS. And as the modern era or economic era came to a close in 1999, it would seem as though we were on the verge of yet another format war. But this time, it was different, way different. The technology behind DVDs and what it offered was far too much for VHS to compete with. What it became was hardly a war. There was no battle. There was no fight. VHS really couldn't stand against DVDs. What we romantically refer to as the format war between VHS and DVD was hardly that. It was more VHS slowly passing the torch to DVD and humbly handing over its home media crown. VHS simply had no dog in the fights. Any gauntlet thrown down would be a pointless endeavor. There was no battle to be had. The technology of DVD was just far too superior. 
the writing was on the wall, and the days of VHS were numbered. 1999 would draw the curtain back on the final age of VHS, and the latter era would begin. This would last until 2006, when VHS would finalize its defeat. During these final seven years, VHS was still very active, and no one was entirely sure when it was going to close its doors, so to speak. Everyone knew that VHS was going to be replaced by DVD, they just did not know when that was going to happen. And as it turns out, 2006 would be that year. And all the while, VHS was sort of trying to compete with DVD. Well, in its own meager way, there was only so much it could do, and maybe compete is not the right word. But they did try, and some of these latter era VHS did offer bonus content, like making of featurettes, deleted scenes, and theatrical trailers. There was a bit of a push to stay relevant to the consumer, it just didn't matter at this point. As movies were being put on DVDs, they were still being released on VHS as well, but soon this would dwindle out. And not every movie that was released during the latter era era was put on VHS. Some studios decided not to bother and go right to DVD only. But a lot of movies were put on VHS, a lot more than you think. Because even though it was dying, VHS was still a pretty big deal, and a lot of people were hesitant to make the switch. So, a lot of newer movies were put on VHS, they just didn't make a lot of them, which is why some of them are very hard to find today. Yeah, they did low production runs on these new VHS releases, because given the rising power of DVD, they didn't know how well they would sell. That being the case, latter era VHS is actually more rare than origin era VHS or romantic era VHS. You would have an easier time finding the first media home entertainment distribution of Halloween than you would the 2006 New Line Home Video distribution of A History of Violence. And that is absolutely the case. Towards the end of 2005, it was pretty clear that VHS only had one more year to go. In 2006, the home media giant was put out to pasture. But that doesn't mean VHS simply ceased to exist. We do have one more era, an era that's going strong today. And that is the post-modern era. It is a time when the nostalgic love for VHS has immortalized the most famous home media format. It is the time of the VHS collector, where VHS lives on forevermore as cherished antiques and relics of a bygone age. And the post-modern era even includes VHS that still in production. Yes, some filmmakers and studios prefer the aesthetic of the classic home media format. In one form or another, VHS is still very much alive. DVDs and Blu-rays may be superior technology, but they'll never replace the impact VHS had on our culture and the hold it has on our hearts. Well, we've reached the end of our little adventure through the history of VHS. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give me a like and hit subscribe if you haven't already, and share this stuff. I can use all the help I can get. So take care out there. Vio con Dios. Sayonara. And I'll see you next time. Only on Captain Adams VHS Pirate Ship.